Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today's webinar, we'll be talking about making the journey to FedRAMP with Cisco Umbrella, Altinity, and ClickHouse-based analytics. It is my pleasure today to uh, be presenting with Pauline Young from Cisco. My name is Robert Hodges. So uh, before we get into the, the bios and into the meat of this presentation, I'd just like to give you a little bit of uh, information and housekeeping that will help you enjoy this webinar. First of all, as you probably just heard, this webinar is being recorded. And for everyone who's signed up, you will get a link to the recording along with uh, the uh, a link to the slides at the end of this webinar. We'll send it to you through email, probably come out in the next 24 hours. Um, second, we have plenty of time for questions. You can post them into the chat or into the question and answer box, which I know that some of you have already used. Uh, just as something comes up, please feel free to, to post it and we'll we'll get to the question when we can. Uh, if it's something relevant, we may answer it as we go along, but otherwise we'll we'll catch all the questions at the end. So with that, I think we've got all the information uh, that we need and uh, let's jump in. Um, Pauline, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, this is Pauline Young. I'm a software engineer at Cisco. Uh, I've been doing uh, data engineering, set ops, set ops uh, for the past decade with uh, Cisco. Great. And once again, my name is Robert Hodges. I've been working on database systems for 40 years. Uh, most recently, of course, ClickHouse, but systems going back to pre-relational databases like M204. Uh, I've been involved in Kubernetes security and, and other topics as well. Uh, as my, my day job is, I'm the CEO at Altenity. So, Let's jump in um, just to as a level set here, because our talk today will be mostly technical, but I think it's important to start with just the, the obvious question of what is FedRAMP. So FedRAMP is a security compliance program that the US government system has created, and it's designed for systems that process government data. It is widely used. Uh, many large vendors have experience with it. and uh, the reason is that it's a pretty standard requirement for doing business with the U.S. government, any of the intelligence agencies, uh, Department of Defense, and many other uh, agencies within the government. This is obviously a very large market. So as a result, it's something that commonly occurs, particularly for uh, large systems. It is uh, There are multiple levels of compliance to FedRAMP. We're not going to go into detail about them, but they basically... At the highest level of uh, FedRAMP compliance, there are literally hundreds of, of requirements that you need to meet. And uh, these are for systems that process uh, very, very sensitive data and uh, the, the compliance levels and requirements are correspondingly high. For commercial applications, moderate is a fairly common requirement. It has a more constrained set of, uh, of requirements it's very common to uh, run these systems in, th in things like GovCloud. And then there's low, which is, uh, we won't talk about today, most of the people that we've had contact with do not, uh, do not implement that. So as you'll see from this talk, FedRAMP compliance systems commonly run in GovCloud or, or similar uh, secure requirements. In the particular case we're talking about today, uh, we'll be talking uh, a fair bit about GovCloud itself. So. With that, I'd like to dive in and go ahead and turn this over to Pauline, who's going to introduce Cisco Umbrella, how it uses ClickHouse, and kind of get into the story about how they're um, how they're uh, building an analytic system that runs under FedRA. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, so Cisco Umbrella is working on um, qualifying for FedRA moderate for security services. Uh, Security services in Cisco Umbrella logs all our activities to, to ClickHouse, and those logs are used for security report, activity search, and threat intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. So what is Cisco Umbrella? So Cisco Umbrella runs in the edge of the cloud. It protects customers when they access cloud services. Uh, from their devices. These cloud services include a host of things, including Office 365, Salesforce, your corporate cloud, uh, and any other such cloud services. And the identities on the left 
that access the cloud services can come from the headquarter, come from branch offices, come from mobile roaming devices, or it could be network devices. Next slide, please. And the Cisco umbrella provided multiple layer of defenses to, and this layer of defenses consists of different types of services. And these services are set up based on the customer configured policy, as well as the threat intelligence collected in our Cisco Telos. So the first layer of defense is DNS security. So DNS security is used to block domains, detect DNS tunneling, provide DNS DDoS protection, et cetera. If anything make it through this first layer, we'll have a second layer of defense called the firewall as a service, which provides intrusion protection. It, it could block tunnels, protocols, IPs, ports, users or group identities. So those are typical functions of a, a firewall as a services. And if any bad guys made it through it, it would go to the security web gateway and remote browser isolation. So these services can block website, prevent browser-based exploit, prevent drive by download, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if it still, the bad actors still made it through, it would reach the cloud access security broker, which provide another host of services like malware protection, non-web traffic inspection, data loss protection. And one example of that is like uh, prevent data leak by blocking email that send credit card information from a corporate network. So if all, if the identity made it through all these security services, they still have to go through the zero trust network access. So it re this required the identity to authenticate the trustworthiness before they are granted access. So you may say, well, if I have to go through all these, would my request be slowed? Uh, you don't have to worry about that because Cisco is a networking company and we are doing network peering with all the major cloud services provider. And because of that, we do not incur additional latency to your services. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, that all these security services locks all their security activities to ClickHouse. Uh, the, the largest volume of activity logs are from DNS. And at this peak, it could reach almost 800 megabytes per second. Therefore, we have a very large ClickHouse cluster to, to store all these uh, logs. And all the rest of the logs combined it to about 120 mega, megabyte per second. So this large ClickHouse cluster we created back in 2019, as you can see, is running version 19.4. It provided one year of data retention, and it has since grown to almost 500, over 500 nodes, storing 2.2 petabyte of data with 45 trillion rows. The smaller cluster was created uh, in 2020. It has one month retention. And it has 27 nodes, 56 terabyte, and 240 billion rows. So these are very large database. We also store uh, one month of data in S3 bucket for offline processing uh, that we generate data to feed into our threat intelligence system. As I mentioned, it, uh, the ClickHouse logs are used for security report and activity search, which requires uh, some pretty intensive aggregation. Therefore, we cannot really serve more than 80 requests per second. Uh, and, uh, next slide, please. So now we have to go to FIPS. Uh, it's a federal information processing standards. And uh, FIPS 142 is used in the US as well as uh, Canada and Japan. You will see the word FIPS repeated over and over in the next few slides, because that is the main thing that we try to get compliance with. And the FIPS certification itself is a very long process. 
And if the software that's FIPS compliance changed, you have to be recertified. Uh, next slide, please. Since, as I mentioned it, all the components has to be uh, FIPS compliance. So in our GovCloud Clickhouse cluster, you can see that all the communication between components has to go over at TLS, which means all the software has to be FIPS compliance. And FIPS, com FIPS compliance means the uh, crypto module you are using has to meet a certain uh, standard uh, that has to be uh, certified. So in our GovCloud, we have to enable FIPS in the AWS account itself. If the default is it's not enabled. You have to make a special request. And uh, when you create the ALB, the application load balancer, you have to use a special tag to enable FIPS. Again, even ALB is stand up in GovCloud, it's, not, it's defaulted to not enable FIPS. The, the CH proxy has to be compiled with the boring SSL library, which is FIPS compliance. And the ClickHouse software itself has to be compiled with boring SSL. And so is the ClickHouse backup and it has to point to an S3 FIPS endpoint. In order to do that, you set up an environment variable to achieve it. Like some of the configuration for FIPS might look odd compared to other configuration in AWS services. And again, Zookeeper, we have to use the FIP compliance bouncy castle jar. And uh, to build, to, to build, all the components deploy and configuration, we use Jenkins. So CH proxy, we built in Jenkins inside the boundary. So anything you do inside the boundary, you cannot move it out of the boundary. So we have to host it in JFlow Artifactory, which is allowed in GovCloud. So at deploy time, we could pull back CH proxy from JFlow Artifactory. And we use, uh, and we use Datadog as a monitoring system, also because Datadog is allowed in GovCloud. So we have to migrate it from our Graphite Grafana system to Datadog. And uh, since Altinity is building the um, ClickHouse packages for us, we are allowed to pull it in into Jenkins for our deployment and con configuration. And the uh, the code we use in Jenkins, which is Terraform, uh, which is Terraform and Ansible, are hosted in the GitHub outside. And we also can, we allowed it to pull that in. Next slide, please. So this slide is basically what I talked about in the last slide. Uh, and it gives you all the details of what we needed to do to be FIPS compliance. Uh, I'll pass it to, uh, Pass it to Robert. Uh, Robert, are you there? Pauline, are you able to hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Sorry about that. It's uh, I'm having a little bit of an audio problem here, but I think we'll get through it. Okay, great. Let's dive in. Uh, oh, don't want to do that. It's a slideshow. All right. Sorry for the disruption here. Okay. Uh, so, so we we see as the that 
you know, FIPS is pervasive here. So uh, what we did was did a FIPS compatible build of ClickHouse. But before I explain that, I need to explain how we, what kind of builds do we do? And we create something called Altinity Stable Builds. And they are open source builds of ClickHouse that are designed for enterprise uh, users in production systems. So uh, they're based on the long-term support releases of ClickHouse. If you use ClickHouse, you know that about every six months or so, there is a release. It's typically in March and another one in August that is labeled as a long-term support release. And what that means is the community will support it for up to a year. Um, and it's meant to be one that people can go use and then it will stick around for a while and continue to receive patches even many months after, after it was initially released. Now, so we, um, in our fork of ClickHouse up on GitHub, we, uh, you know, we copy that in and then we add selected bug fixes and features. So our customers, uh, users, uh, for example, uh, need certain bug fixes that may not be, um, it may not be available or may not have reached the, uh, uh, the, the official, the, the regular LTS builds. So we put those in, uh, we all back, we also backport certain features so that people can run ClickHouse without having to upgrade to get things they really need. And of course we do patches for CVEs. We vet them very thoroughly for production use. So when you use an alternative stable build, one of the things you'll find is that we're always kind of behind the, the leading edge of ClickHouse development. And there's a reason for that. It's the same reason that Red Hat uh, the Enterprise isn't quite the same as hot off the presses uh, Linux builds because you need to let things stabilize, make sure that they are really uh, ready to go, do upgrades, uh, test them, and uh, you know ensure that they're 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 really ready for use and won't won't bomb on you. We offer three years of support, so uh, and in fact longer in some cases, um, and they're one hundred percent open source. So we don't, uh, there's no holdbacks on, on this. It's not an open core model. It, it, it's just another build of ClickHouse with a different um, uh, set of support. And of course we strive for as far as it is humanly possible for full compat compatibility with upstream ClickHouse. So you can use these built in interchangeably and pack people in fact do flip them back and forth. So this is the basis. We've been doing these builds for a while. And um, and they're fairly popular, used by a lot of people, like Sentry, for example, um, and and of course Cisco, as we're developing, as as we're describing here. Now, when you have an application like that, the question is, well, how do you take the existing application and make it FIPS compatible? So there's basically four steps. The first is, as you saw in Pauline's slide just a few minutes ago, pretty much everything in this whole system uses uh, boring SSL. Uh, ClickHouse a couple of years ago also switched to boring SSL. So it is a version of SSL, an implementation done by Google uh, for their own, uh, you know, basically for their own uh, purposes, but now widely used by other applications. So the first thing we do is we, uh, we switch off the, uh, or switch away from the boring SSL that's included in ClickHouse and go to a version of boring SSL that was actually verified for FIPS. So there's several versions of this that were uh, verified for FIPS uh, 140.2. We go take the latest one, um, grab the source code, and we're going to compile and link against that version so that we have uh, crypto, which in every respect possible is compatible with, um, uh, with the verified code. The next thing that we do is we make sure that ClickHouse itself can uh, properly support FIPS. You have to do some very modest API changes. Um, and we also have a different version number and what's also called a FIPS self-check. In FIPS compatible software, uh, what'll, when, the, when the software comes up, as you'll see in a minute, it does what's called a, um, a known answer test. And this is to make sure that the crypto modules have not been touched and uh, somehow um, uh, changed, which would, would allow um, attackers to, to get into the software. So, so you really have a, you have a completely different binary with FIPS support and very and slightly different behavior. Um, the third thing we do is provide configuration information. An awful lot of FIPS um, operation is simply configuring your software correctly. We'll show you examples of that. And then of course you test the daylights out of it. And this is one of the big things about security in general is you have to test things very carefully. It's not just because uh, you know it's not just because you're afraid of evildoers will find uh, 
uh, you know, hidden doorways uh, to get in your stuff. It's just that security is very persnickety. And if you don't set things up perfectly, they don't work and they don't give you very good answers. So we test the daylights out of this to make sure that, that not only the software, but also the configuration works. So the FIPS compatible alternative stable builds, we began uh, building these in January. Uh, so they're based on ClickHouse version 22.8. Uh, the, the upcoming uh, alternative stable 23.3 will also support them, of course. We maintain them in a separate branch. Uh, it is identical to mainline ClickHouse, except for some very small changes. Um, the self-check, the, the known answer test, the software version, and then some extensions. The, the main place we made, it ch made changes was to uh, made some changes to ClickHouse Keeper. We'll talk about those in a minute. So we use the boring SSL source code that was certified on June 29th of last year. And we also use this as another important part of being FIPS compliant if you're if you're building these applications, is boring crypto has a build procedure and you have to follow that. So we actually make changes to the to the clickhouse build procedure as well. And then finally, the the specific crypto behavior is verified um, using an alternative test suite that covers both single server operation as well as cluster operation and uh, has a, a very large number of test cases. We have thousands and thousands of test cases, not just for FIPS, but, um, but for many other things as well. So in fact, that, that brings up how do we test them? Well, when we, uh, when we release these, we of course are gonna run all the available uh, ClickHouse tests. Those are abundant, very uh, large number of unit and integration tests. Those are the things that you would get out of the ClickHouse repo. Of course, we have a fork of it. Um, which basically matches upstream. And then we have our own regression tests. Those are in a separate GitHub repo that anybody can see or look at. And finally, we do code scans. Uh, they're particularly SNCC and Scout are very good at scanning containers. That's a really good way of picking up stuff that is included in your build. It implicitly uh, tests your packages. And, and so we do those, make sure they're clean before we, before we go out. Um, there are specific tests for crypto behavior. So as I mentioned, uh, one that tests the crypto between applications and a single server ClickHouse, and then the other one that tests the crypto functions in uh, ClickHouse clusters. So these are specific test cases and you can look at them and see what we do and we add to them constantly. So how do you get these builds? Uh, well, you go to builds.alternity.cloud and there's a section in the build page where you uh, there's a channel that you can use to pick up the, you know, your um, your RPMs or your um, uh, your Debian your .deb uh, files, and uh, you know just install them. The other thing you can do is you can actually build it yourself if you really want to. We of course do that, but as I said, this stuff is open source. We're not trying to 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 prevent anybody from doing this, but you can go ahead and and check out the right branch. And then uh, may then build it using CMake, and uh, and uh, if you don't mind waiting around for a couple hours. So a really important part of running FIPS, as I mentioned, is configuration. So we have documentation for setting up a FIPS compatible alternative build, but basically it consists of three parts. Uh, first of all, you need to shut off the non FIPS ports, as we'll see shortly. Not every not every uh, listener that the ClickHouse server has supports uh, FIPS crypto. And um, we'll see an example of that in a minute. There's also a specific configuration file that we recommend you add. It's called FIPS.xml. Um, and it does things like sets TLS uh, uh, versions and specifies allowed uh, ciphers. Uh, it also has, in our example, it will uh, shut off ports. And then you just go ahead and start the server and verify that it works. And this is an example of a uh, FIPS uh, of a FIPS startup uh, looking at the logs, and you just grab for FIPS mode. You'll see this cat uh, test result one. That means that uh, ClickHouse came up. We checked the FIPS libraries. They look like they're not. They haven't been um, messed with, and so the server continues running. If um, if they have been changed, the server will just stop. It'll just crash right there. So that way you know that this is a little bit of a difference. If, if FIPS thinks that something's wrong, it'll just stop the server right there and uh, things will fail. So turning off ports, um, 
you probably know if you're a regular user of ClickHouse that, Click, that ClickHouse offers a wide variety of network protocols. And what that means is you can have literally, you know, 10 or 15 ports that are potentially open on a ClickHouse server. So as we're, uh, as we're looking at the ClickHouse server, it's really important to uh, ensure that only the that you're only using the ports that actually have uh, FIP supported crypto. And those are the ones that are labeled in green here. So for just for the native TCP protocol, which is standard for, um, which is standard for, uh, 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 you know, for many applications, uh, port 9440 is the one that you want to have open. That's the TCP uh, secure port. Um, you have other types of things like MySQL protocol all the way down to uh, Prometheus metrics. These are not guaranteed to uh, to support FIPS at this time, uh, so you want to shut those off. And then you have um, ports that are used internally. So, for example, the ClickHouse server uses port um, when it's secure, port nine zero one zero, to fetch parts for replications. And then we have a couple of new ports for uh, for folks who uh, are have not used recent versions of of ClickHouse. These are to support ClickHouse Keeper, which is a built-in replacement for ZooKeeper. And they include a port to uh, that you communicate with when you're trying to, uh, for example, find out what parts to uh, uh, to pull down. And then there's also another port that's used by uh, Raft, which is the consensus protocol that uh, ClickHouse Keeper uses to keep nodes in sync. So what we we'll want to do is make sure the green ports are on, the red ports are off, and the gray ports are off. Let's see an example of that. So here's the FIPS.XML file. Uh, this is something that you just uh, set up, and this is a typical example. Uh, these are things that you would probably find in all versions of it. But for example, you can see this remove equals true for the HTTP port. That shuts it down, even if one of the def even if the default config.xml that's provided for uh, ClickHouse turns that port on. So this is a way of of turning it off and making sure and making sure that it's truly off. Um, the uh, Within the, uh, we have what's called the open SSL context. That is the information used for both server and uh, client communications. I'm just showing the server section, but the the items marked in yellow are, are critical for FIPS operation. So for example, this cipher list that you see is a list of accepted ciphers under FIPS. If your clients can't talk to these ciphers, then um, the connection will be refused. Uh, similarly, we turn off all versions of uh, all protocols other than uh, TLS uh, uh, version 1.2. That's the only one that's supported by FIPS. And then the verification mode in this particular case is, is relaxed, which means that clients can uh, connect without having to show a certificate, but it's very easy to change this to strict, in which case your clients must also display a certificate signed by an authority that ClickHouse recognizes. So this is your typical setup. It's really not very hard to, to, to bring this up and have the, the crypto uh, uh, behave in a FIPS uh, compatible manner. So um, that's the servers. Let's talk about something a little bit more complicated, which is to enable a FIPS compatible ClickHouse cluster. So when we turn to clusters, these are going to add complexity and they're going to increase the scope of APIs that are available for attack. So in a real system like uh, what Pauline and, and the Cisco folks are running, you have multiple ClickHouse servers. Those are, you have applications connected to them, of course, but within the ClickHouse servers, you will have distributed queries. So these are one ClickHouse server may send subqueries out to other ClickHouse servers. Uh, for example, on sharded data, um, you also have uh, fetches between servers to, to collect the parts for replicated tables. In order to support replication, ClickHouse is going to contact ZooKeeper. And it does this for a couple of reasons. One is to, um, there's a leader election protocol that's used when you're, when you're merging data to make sure that nobody else is merging the same stuff. And then there's just coordination of replication, keeping lists of who has which parts of the tables to, uh, to replicate. Furthermore, ZooKeeper makes requests between nodes Zookeepers together are known as an ensemble, and they use something called Zookeeper Atomic um, Broadcast, which is the protocol that those nodes use to keep track of what they're doing and make sure that they're all in sync. So these are 
different ways that there's different types of information flowing uh, back and forth here. We need to protect this information and ensure that, uh, uh, you know, ensure that uh, it can't be hacked. So um, centralized coordination is the particularly interesting part. The, uh, if we turn to the, for example, the replicated part fetches, distributed queries, this is actually pretty easy to do because it basically, if you set up that SSL config and just enable ports properly, the, uh, the replicated part fetches and the distributed queries will also use FIPS compliant crypto. What is important though is, is it's the centralized coordination part. And a big question that comes up and one that we asked ourselves in, in implementing this is do we use Zookeeper or ClickHouse Keeper? So Zookeeper is the traditional, the original way that the ClickHouse did coordination. ClickHouse Keeper is an, a built-in replacement that implements the Zookeeper APIs. And so the question is, which one should we use? Well, you can actually use both of them. Uh, one of the things that we did as part of this project was we did um, work on Zookeeper and we have a version of it which can use the uh, what are called the FIPS uh, Bouncy Castle uh, libraries. It's a, a, a Java security provider which is uh, can be incorporated into Zookeeper in the build and it works. So uh, we've set this up uh, or more accurately, Pauline and the Cisco team have set this up. It works fine. It passes our tests. It works uh, in, in the Cisco um, environments. There are some downsides to this. One is that it's hard to maintain. So it turns out that for internal reasons, uh, Zookeeper has used Bouncy Castle libraries also to implement all many of their, uh, their security tests. And that the library version that they use is incompatible with the FIPS um, approved or FIPS compliant Bouncy Castle libraries. So it makes it very difficult to run tests. In fact, the, the build kind of breaks if you try to run the tests with the FIPS compatible libraries. And, um, and so as a result, if you, if you have to change something in, in Zookeeper, it's gonna be difficult to verify that you got it right. The second thing is a more general concern, which is that for ClickHouse, ClickHouse Keeper is the future. Uh, for new projects, there are still some in there are still some ways in which Zookeeper is more reliable, but uh, Keeper is improving quickly, and so we wanted to make sure we were on a path to, um, uh, uh, you know, to to uphold that and and to have something that that would be maintainable in future. So, what we've done is we've uh, done an extra step, which is to ensure that ClickHouse Keeper can be fully FIPS compliant, and of course. You can compile with the with the um, with the FIPS verified boring SSL. The same build that um, that generates the ClickHouse server will also uh, generate Keeper, which can also run inside the server. So that part was pretty straightforward. But what we had to do was update the what's called the new Raft library, and that is the library that implements the Raft uh, protocol to keep the, the to make sure that the Keepers stay coordinated. And um, that did require making some changes. The biggest one was basically to have it use the same SSL context that we use for configuring crypto on any ClickHouse server. So we made those changes and now we're testing the daylights out. And the reason is of course, that if you don't get the, it, if you don't get this perfect, it, it doesn't work and it doesn't give you a lot of information, why not? So, FIPS compatible keeper is on the way. Uh, it will come out as part of as um, supported in Altenity uh, Stable 23.3. That's the next LTS release should be out uh, late this month. And there's a FIPS, as I mentioned, we have a FIPS version of the Altenity Stable releases, and uh, you will now be able to to run Keeper in a FIPS compatible way. So. Those are the changes uh, that we made to ClickHouse. There's just a couple other short topics that uh, come up with FedRAMP. Um, one is uh, certificates. Another one is just thinking about hardening ClickHouse more broadly. Um, so one of the issues that we ran into in the environment that in the Cisco environment is that they don't use a single, they have an internal CA, but they don't use uh, just a, a root certificate and then generate server certificates, they in fact have a certificate chain. This is uh, fairly common. And in ClickHouse, 
the uh, the behavior of this uh, of certificate change is not well tested, which is not to say it doesn't work. It's just that it takes effort to set it up properly. So one common way that you can do it is if you have a root certificate with certificate with intermediate um, certs, you can just glom them together in a single CRT file, um, which in this example we choose to call root chain.crt. And then you keep your server.crt, which is your ClickHouse server um, in, a, in a separate uh, certificate file alongside the, the primary key. Or excuse me, the, the, um, uh, the private key. So, uh, so this is something that we had to test and then, um, and just to make sure that it works. And then if you configure this way, you'll then, uh, you will then have, uh, you'll point your CA config, which is the, um, the tag that says where to go to find your your root certificate and any and, and any certificates in the chain, um, you'll go find them in in this uh, in this location. Uh, cert path is actually just something you fill in. We, you actually need the full path. So um, so that works fine. Um, and then you know it uh, it will work. The problem is that there actually are cases where the clients want to see the. It turns out that they don't have access to the um, you know, to the other certificates in the chain for a variety of reasons. It, um, it may be that they don't have them loaded. Uh, it may be that they're using a different code. In that case, what we have found is there are cases where you need to do the opposite. You you have roots, the root CRT, which is your certificate or author, authority certificate. And then um, in ClickHouse, you will go ahead and glom the intermediate servers uh, or certificates together with your server certificate into server.crt, it then gets downloaded to the um, to the client and the client can verify them properly. So these are uh, you know, just a, an example of some of the ins and outs you get with certificate config configuration, depending on your application, you may need to do one way or the other. Um, this gets us to the final issue. You know, once you have all of this stuff set up, you've basically covered the crypto part, um, particularly con network connectivity, um, for uh, ClickHouse, so you're, uh, you, you know, you're sort of halfway there in terms of hardening ClickHouse um, because you, you know, you've protected the, uh, you know, you've got good certificates, you've, uh, you know, your your connections are encrypted, you've done away with uh, um, unnecessary open ports. There are a number of other things that you need to um, cover in order to operate safely in a FedRAMP environment and to and to meet compliance. Um, these are shown in the picture. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Pauline, who's going to talk about uh, some of the automation that she's put together to set up an operational system. So Pauline, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, at Cisco, we use Terraform to deploy the ClickHouse cluster in EC2s. And uh, this EC2 is running Ubuntu 2004, and it is FIPS enabled and also hardened. Um, we use three different Ansible playbooks to deploy. First, we deploy the Zookeeper and configure it and bring it up. And then next, we will uh, configure ClickHouse and bring it up. And last, we'll configure and bring up CH proxies. So I'm just showing a small example of our Ansible code. Uh, which is part of the uh, ClickHouse playbook. So we uh, added, we prefetched the uh, GPG uh, key uh, from the GitHub repo and uh, we store it in the file. So at deploy time, so this is stored in the file in the, with, with the Ansible code. So at deploy time, we would uh, install this certificate to the, uh, sorry, install the key to the keychain. Uh, next slide, please. And then we will add the repo location to our um, repository list. Then uh, we would install the packages. So those three steps are the Ansible equivalent of what you see in the uh, command line uh, version in the Altinity website. Uh, next slide, please. So to address some of the securities, uh, holes that uh, Robert has brought up. Uh, we, we did quite a few things. Uh, some of them are, 
We add a filter to reduct the click host password when we run Ansible from Jenkins because uh, the password is stored in the clear. So during configuration time, we have to create a template of the configuration file and insert the password into that configuration file. But we reduct the password when we print it out from Ansible. Um, so we close all the uh, non-FIPS port, but we still allow uh, port 900 so we could use so it could be used by the data dot agent locally to access uh, metrics that we could send to the data dot server. And uh, we only uh, send the error logs to data dot for centralized logging uh, because the regular query logs we the regular regular logs some con may con may contain customer sensitive uh, information. And we also encrypt the uh, our EPS, uh, so we have encryption at rest. Um, so I'll pass it back to Robert. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Pauline. So uh, we're at the conclusion. We'll just uh, uh, go ahead and highlight. We're this is a a journey for us, and uh, you know we're still learning, but I think there are some things that are very very clear in this process that we've learned so far. And uh, the first one is just, you make everything FIPS compliant. And this was something where I'm very grateful that we had guidance from, from Cisco, who has uh, done this kind of thing many times, uh, that, you know, we go ahead and, and, and sort of get on this train and getting ClickHouse to be one of the cars in the train was, was a big part of, 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 you know, making progress. Um, second thing we learned was that Zookeeper is really not a long-term solution for FIPS compliant ClickHouse. And the reason is, is maintenance. Zookeeper is, works great. We have, I'd say our customers are split about half and half, uh, or maybe even more on, um, uh, on Zookeeper because they tend to trend toward systems that have been around for a while. Uh, but it's not a long-term solution. And this is a good, this is yet another good reason for, for switching to Keeper uh, because we can maintain it and, uh, and it's also more consistent with the rest of ClickHouse uh, in terms of setup. The I, one of the things we really benefited from the fact, uh, you know, in this process was the fact that you, Pauline, you had set up these Ansible. Uh, you you were already using Ansible, so you just modified your playbooks, and you could deploy stuff quickly and 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 efficiently, um, and consistently. Um, they yet another lesson is. The QA people are gods on this project, and uh, you have to test everything. And it's not so much that things don't work. I mean, there are cases where you have bugs, but more the more practical issue is that crypto setup is just very complex and it's very delicate. And as one of our, our one of our other devs said, there are many more ways to configure incorrectly than correctly. And as as you know, if you tried to set this stuff up, you'll connect. It will just give you some obscure error message or it simply won't connect. Your applications, depending on their on what they do, may or may not even, even give you an error. It just won't work. So, um, so that testing, what we found was that the best way to ensure that we had the, uh, the configuration right was actually to read it out of a working regression test. Unfortunately, we have a, a pretty rich set of those. And every time we would find a new situation, put it in the tests, and then once we've got in the test, we could document what that test did. And that um, brings up the last thing, which is that the documentation and configuration guidelines are absolutely essential to success. This is something going forward that we'll be doing. Um, you'll see that, um, you know, we're doing presentations like this. We have a, a, a webinar on hardening, hardening um, uh, ClickHouse servers that we did last week, uh, but we're also going to be adding considerably to our documentation headed in the direction of uh, providing documentation that can serve as actual uh, baselines for operation in FedRAMP and CIS environments. That's another big compliance standard that's popular in Europe. So, uh, uh, so this is this is something that that we know we need to do and 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 that we are doing. So just a little bit of background information here. This is uh, pointing to Altenity. Uh, you can also go, of course, to the uh, to government uh, to, uh, gov sites to find out about uh, FedRAMP as well as FIPS uh, 140-2. Uh, that information is is all publicly available. And 
with that, our our talk is done. Um, I, Paulina, just before we take any questions, I I want to thank you for the the work together. It's been really fun collaborating on this. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to to learning more. So for um, uh, folks on the call, any questions that we can answer? Don't be shy. All right. Uh, actually, uh, Vitaly, I noticed Vitaly Zokosnikov is on the uh, call. Uh, Vitaly, if I, I just putting you on the spot, I wonder if you can, if you have any thoughts to share, because you had your team, obviously, and you yourself were deeply involved in, in getting this to work. I'm just curious what you've learned in anything that you've learned over and above what we've discussed here that you could share. Well, I think you made the main points, Robert. That uh, you know, uh, sec you know, anything to do with security is tricky, and setting up even SSL certificates and configuration is not straightforward. So definitely, you know, uh, even debugging this as we were developing tests was a very, <laughs> you know, uh, productive and uh, adventure. You know, because many things didn't work. You know, there's so many ways to mess up. So that's why, like you mentioned, configuration guidelines and just having a known uh, working configuration is critical to get this right. Yeah, and we have a we use a a, a, a testing scheme called Test Flows that actually is really nice because it's very. This is developed by Vitaly. It uh, it basically steps through, goes through tests in a very step-by-step -step manner. And at each step, it says, well, I'm doing this and I expect that. And and so you can kind of read out to, you, you get these very long logs, but the thing is, you know, the exact steps down to the smallest detail of, of, of what you're changing. And then of course, you can reverse engineer those to, to do your configuration guides. So that's been, you know, Vitaly, I think that for me was like, it's obviously confirmation bias. I, I'm used to do QA too, but I think that's been enormously helpful in this project. Good. Um, any, if there are no further questions, um, I think we can close this down, but thanks again, Pauline. This has just been a pleasure uh, doing this, uh, you know, doing this presentation, summarizing what we've learned so far. And I think when, you know, as we get further along and have, uh, have even more stuff, we should um, perhaps do a repeat of it, perhaps at a conference somewhere. Yeah, thank you, Robert and Vitalia, for all your help to Cisco. You helped make our FedRAM journey um, more smooth and fast. <laughs> Filled in a few potholes. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for attending. We will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Thanks.